Well, as I was saying, my father decided that I would be fit for the clergy. And so he enrolled me in the Boston Latin School with that prospect in mind. <laughs> that lasted a year, yes, until my father determined that he couldn't afford it. And so then I was sent for another year at the public school in Boston. And that was the end of my education. Although not quite. I, I, I shan't go into all of the stories of my life. They, they no doubt will be boring to you. You certainly know most of them. I know them by heart. <laughs> but I, I thought what we might do, because I've always enjoyed good conversation, is that we might engage in a conversation, you and I, I uh, certainly am anxious to know your thoughts of the world and what you have experienced and what you think is proper and where this great nation of ours may go into the future. And uh, I would certainly be far more interested in your opinions than I am with mine. And so uh, we shall engage in a conversation. I want you to feel free to ask questions, to make comments, to make observations. And that way, we may more freely um, experience one another and learn from one another. This, this is, after all, the proper way to learn. And perhaps along the way, I will have occasion to tell you a, a few tales from my life that are not uh, necessarily popularly known. <laughs> At any rate, uh, we shall begin. Yes? Anyone? Yes? Yes, yes. Do you have a question or a comment? Did you marry? Did I marry? <laughs> well, as much as I have tried in my life to avoid being a politician, I must give you a politician's answer. I did, and I didn't. <laughs> yes, you see, my wife, uh, my Debbie, Deborah, Deborah Reed, you know, the first time I saw Deborah Reed is when I was scrambling up Market Street from the dock in Philadelphia, having just arrived, with virtually no money in my pocket, and, and three rolls, uh, one in each pocket and one under my arm. Uh, and I was bedraggled and dirty. I had no clean clothing whatsoever. And here I was marching up Market Street, and I looked over and I saw this very comely young lass whose name was Deborah Reed. Well, life passed along. I became apprenticed in the printing trade, and looking for a place to stay, a place to rest my head, the master of the shop suggested that I might apply to the reeds. Well, I met her again. We passed some time together, and in fact, we determined that uh, we would marry. But then circumstances sent me off to England at the behest of then Governor Keith. Well, the promises of Governor Keith, not his behest at all. Well, I was in England for a year and a half before I returned to Philadelphia. And when I came back, I discovered that my Deborah had wed someone else. Ah, but this man had abandoned her, yes, and run off uh, to the islands, so it was said. Well, and Deborah and I decided that we wished to be man and wife, but because it could not be proven uh, that her husband, who had run off, was not dead, uh, we could not marry legally. And so our marriage was common law. Yes, it was not celebrated in any church or before any altar or in any official way. But we were married nonetheless, yes, yes, and very happily. 
as that was in that was in 1730. We wed, and my Deborah left me. She died in 1774. Aha, yes, well, as to my thoughts of Mr. Adams, there is a quality to the Adamses, you see. A quality that, and particularly found in John, a quality that they, they, they wish to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. And as I said to Mr. Rutledge on the way to the peace conference, as Mr. Adams was riding on ahead of us, I simply shook my head and said, ah, the Adams is always first in line to be hanged. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Adams, Mr. Adams is, a, is an honest man, a man of integrity, a man of considerable brilliance. But, unfriendly in his countenance. He is very stiff. He is very judgmental and often very envious of others. Uh, this causes him to be suspicious, you see. And I, I give that largely to the fact that he was raised in Massachusetts, which I, I had the good fortune to escape when I was 17, actually. <laughs> no, but but I, I do not wish to give you the mistaken impression that he was in any way dishonorable. He, he was a um, staunch patriot, a staunch supporter of our independence, uh, and, and I, I believe did his best in all respects. We did have our differences, to say the least, uh, particularly in France, uh, when I was uh, a minister there. And uh, he, and uh, at first, uh, uh, Mr. Dean, uh, but uh, then later Mr. Lee, were, were there along with me as, as ministers, as agents for uh, the Congress. Mr. Adams had a way of insulting people, yes, uh, particularly uh, the French foreign minister, uh, which was not, not a very good idea when we were asking them for money and men and support. Now, so it, it, I, I don't want to dwell too long on him because I, I, I will give you the wrong impression, and I, I do not wish to do so. No, he, he was a fine man. As to your other comment, your other question. It is, it is one perhaps best left unanswered, <laughs> quite frankly. <laughs> but perhaps as the evening goes by and uh, something stronger is brought forward, uh, <laughs> one never knows what will happen, eh? <laughs> I was very supportive of the Crown. I was perhaps one of the one of the most enthusiastic supporters of the Crown. One must go back. I, I first went to Britain for a very short time when I was 17. I, I was returned there by the General Assembly of Pennsylvania uh, because of their conflict with the proprietors, the Pens. Uh, not William Penn. William Penn was an honorable man. Uh, he was a Quaker. Uh, it was his children who uh, turned Anglican and then became dishonorable that we had the quarrel with. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, so that was my first trip. Then I came back for a short time to Philadelphia and I was sent back again to attempt to wrest Pennsylvania away from the Penns and have it declared a royal colony under His Majesty's protection. I believed in Britain. I thought, and in many ways still believe, that the British Constitution was one of the most noble institutions 
ever to come out of the mind of man. And of course, it's not a written constitution. It is the body of English law. It is precedent. It is tradition. But we were envied by all the people in the world, we Britons, as being the most free, having the most liberties of anyone. And we did. Until, until the rise of Parliament. And then you began to see men in Parliament, in government, who were not there to support Britain or the Empire. They were there simply to support themselves. And they proceeded to subvert and pollute the noble English constitution for their own ends. They were simply placemen. And so one arrived at a point where votes in Parliament, in the lower house, even in the House of Lords, were openly bought and sold. No one had the interest of the nation in their heart anymore. They only had the interest of their pocketbooks and their power. And slowly, slowly, what had been very noble began to degrade. I was a great supporter of Britain, and I worked all the way up to the Stamp Act to try and achieve reconciliation between Britain and her American colonies. I went back to uh, the, the Albany Accords, the Albany Plan that I had first proposed uh, during the French and Indian War, wherein uh, all of the colonies would be united under a central government headed by a, a president general, as I proposed. Uh, each colony would have representation, and that this central body would have the power to lay taxes, to make war, to make peace, to secure lands, all in the name of the other colonies, so that we might have concerted protection against our French and Indian enemies. My hope was that we would see a situation wherein the American colonies would gain representation in Parliament and that we would join the Union as had Scotland before. And this would make an empire unparalleled. I had already written uh, that within, well, at least two lifetimes, uh, the population in America would have more Englishmen than you would be able to find in England. Our population would grow that rapidly, and so that we would become the majority, the majority of the British Empire. And with, with trade opportunities and with allowing us to start manufactories and allowing us to, to continue to govern ourselves and our local affairs, it would have been, it would have been a paradise. But it was all ripped apart, all ripped apart. And when they stood me in the cockpit and Alexander Wedderburn had at me for over an hour. That, that is when I turned my back on them. I said, I cannot, I cannot be part of a nation that allows something like this to occur. It was humiliating. It was humiliating. On top of that humiliation, looking back, was how I had allowed myself to be seduced. For I was a placeman as well. I was postmaster general of all the colonies. I held a royal appointment, which two days after the cockpit was removed from me. I think back and I wonder, was I blinded by that? Was I that easily swayed? 
and that too was an embarrassment. And so, after I came back to Philadelphia in 75, I became perhaps the most rabid in favor of independency. Yes, in fact, I proposed it. It took, it took about a year for the others to catch up. <laughs> I, I always made it public that I would be hesitant to speak against the Constitution. Those four months that we spent locked in the hall in Philadelphia, <laughs> six days a week, generally from 10 until 3, sometimes with some most disagreeable, disagreeable debates, what came from that was the best that we could do. Was it the best there ever could be? No. No. But it was the best that we could do. And we put provision in that document so that future generations would be able to improve on our efforts. Perhaps the biggest disappointment to me with regards to the Constitution, well, there are several, but one of the biggest is that we could not put an end to this insidious institution of slavery. We couldn't do it. It was proposed, it was debated, and the southern colonies determined that if we continued that debate, they would walk out and all would be in ruin. Nothing would occur. And so we did the best we could. We simply said that the issue will not be subject to legislation for the next 20 years until 1808. We deferred a decision in order to get all of the rest, you see. There were some pro who proposed that we could have another constitutional convention, and, and, and I was very much opposed to this. I, I had listened to the debates, I knew uh, further discussion would be fruitless. We would only be going over the same issues that we had gone over before. At some point, at some point, one must take what one has in one's hand and bless it. And that's what we did. We put it out for the, for the states to ratify and now we have, in this year of our Lord, 1788, we have gotten the nine states necessary for ratification. It will be the law of the land. But by not addressing the issue, we set the stage for much blood to flow in the future. So you're right. Of course, travel is always an adventure, uh, whether it be on land or by sea. Uh, I rather enjoy it, however. Uh, it, uh, it gives one time to think on sea voyages and also to converse with one's fellow passengers and to see new things when traveling by land and to meet new people and find out what it is they think uh, about the world and about our future, which is always of great interest to me. Uh, so, yes, there were some very, very bad voyages. I can remember one when we almost were put upon the rocks, uh, and, and yet uh, <laughs> we managed to, to be saved. I remember, I remember writing to my wife. I said, well, I think that if I were a Catholic, I probably would have uh, founded uh, a small monument there at that spot. But as I am not, I think that I shall uh, simply uh, buy the captain a drink. <laughs> uh, 
the question had to do with my comment to the lady of Philadelphia who approached me after we came out of the, the building at the end of the Constitutional Convention. And she said, Dr. Franklin, you've been locked in there for four months. What is it you've given us? And I said, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Uh, that was the point of the question as to what I meant. Our debate centered on many issues, one of which was the type of government we should have. Uh, all agreed that a republic is the most noble form of government. Uh, looking back to the classics, the republics of Greece and Rome and their accomplishments and their freedoms and their liberties. We all agreed on a republic, but we all knew that a republic had never successfully survived in history. And some were saying, well, use this as an example. A republic cannot survive. It never has before. Ah, but others said, no, no, we are different from them. We are here in America. We live closer to nature. We're not, we're not polluted by the evils of the old world. We will not succumb to that. That I wonder about for the future, whether we will succumb or no. A republic relies on three very important supports. One is public virtue. Those you, you elect to be your representatives are, as we called them, disinterested men. Uh, they have no other allegiance than the common good. They are beholden to no one for their salaries or their support or their perquisites. They cannot be bought. They look only to the common good, public virtue. And in their discussions, uh, they speak civilly. They weigh each opinion against the other and eventually, by this method, attain the truth, public virtue. The other support is private virtue. The understanding among all citizens of a republic that we are in community, that we do not uh, steal, cheat each other, that we guard the public purse as closely as we guard our own. And the third support, the third support, is a strict adherence to the idea that support for the public good should be as, as enthusiastically engaged in as support for one's own good. Yes? It is a community. It is owned by us in community. We, the people of the United States, it is our United States. And so, we must aid one another. We must be honest with one another. We must point out those who are dishonest, not only to us, but also to the community. There is no more grievous crime in a republic than to steal from the community. That is, that is so grievous, to steal from your own people. I need not remind you what would happen in the Native American tribes when that was discovered. It wasn't very pleasant, I can assure you. No. It requires us to be honorable citizens with the recognition that we are part of something that is much bigger than ourselves and that the success of the community means the success 
of all the individuals in the community. That is a little bit of what I meant and my fear that perhaps that would not be followed in the future. There were plans that were put forward, uh, several plans, and, and in large part this was what the Albany plan dealt with, and, and uh, a mechanism by which uh, the natives could be treated fairly. Uh, it has always been a disgrace uh, the way the natives have been treated. <laughs> I, I wrote a piece Oh, it was a number of years ago now, when I uh, compared uh, the lives of the native society with those of the English society. And I ended it essentially by saying, well, who is the savage? Hmm? <laughs> we must treat them fairly. And I know uh, that after the war, uh, General Washington, uh, General Knox uh, began to uh, put together a scheme uh, whereby uh, the natives would have certain specific lands set aside for them which would be inviolate uh, to anyone else. But following the war, we would never hope, never hope to raise an army the size that would be needed to guard them from encroachment. It, it would be impossible. Uh, you would have to have men standing arm to arm uh, across vast expanses. Public virtue, private virtue. I have to obey the laws. And if the laws say that you cannot settle within a certain area, you simply do not settle there. But I think it's naive to think that that wouldn't happen. <laughs> well, uh, in listening to what was said before, that I was a scientist, I, I've always felt uncomfortable being called a scientist. Sir Isaac Newton was a scientist. Uh, he could uh, postulate a theory and then through very uh, complex experiments and mathematical equations could prove his theory correct. This I am unable to do. I uh, simply observe uh, and postulate on what possibly could be the cause with the hope that others much more genius than I will be able to uh, carry forward with these observations and thoughts uh, to either uh, uh, bring them uh, to truth and uh, create more experiments or to prove that they're wrong. Now, I, I never truly considered myself a scientist. No, no, no. As you said, it was called a philosopher. No, no. Uh, Hume, David Hume was a philosopher. And I'm simply an observer. And uh, I have the bad habit of uh, pointing out the bad habits in others, you see. <laughs> but as to, as to which one gave me the most pleasure? Hmm. I would think, I would think within my experiments on electricity, the determination of the effectiveness of the lightning arrester is what I'm most proud of. Just to think how much property, how many lives that simple instrument has saved. Uh, it, it is amazing. And now, uh, whether here uh, in the United States or in Europe, uh, wherever one goes, uh, one sees the lightning arresters uh, protecting the buildings and the people therein. And I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of that. Y you know, 
with the lightning arrester along with the, the stove that I invented, I was always chided, you see, for not obtaining a patent on any of this. And I said that I refused to do so. I refused to do so. That I looked back at all of the inventions of the past and how they have made our lives better without compensation to those who had dreamt them up. And, and I felt that it was my duty to give whatever I came up with uh, to the people. It was my gift to them. I, I have believed most of my life that the best way to honor God is to help one's fellow man. This has been a guiding principle of mine uh, virtually all my life, uh, from uh, the founding of, of, of the, uh, the, the fire company, uh, the, the library, the hospital, uh, the academy. All of these were done not for any, any receiving of gifts or benefits, but simply to give to my fellow man. And it is something that I have tried to do throughout all my life. And hopefully I have a few more years in which to do it. Oh, <laughs> who would I prefer to have write my biography? Well, well, that's assuming that it's uh, worth being written, yes? <laughs> uh, actually, I have, uh, I have set down uh, quite a few memoirs myself over the years. I've done it in bits and pieces. It, it actually began as a letter to my son, William, uh, but uh, has gone uh, much beyond that indeed. I don't know that I'll ever finish it. Um, and I'm not sure that anyone, even of my contemporaries, would know uh, the whole story. Uh, I'm not sure I would want anyone to know the whole story. <laughs> but, no, let us see. Ah, well, I think, uh, although he's no writer and would certainly not undertake the task, uh, I, I think uh, uh, certainly uh, General Washington would be capable, because he's an honest man and would tell the truth. Um, uh, Jefferson, well, he's, he's quite the writer, but uh, he's much given to long and flowery phrases. And so uh, what might be material for a book that would be, say, 100 pages might turn into an 18-volume set. <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's an interesting question. <laughs> I shall have to think on that. Thank you. <laughs> ah. Well, when I was uh, when I was a young lad, <laughs> when I was a young lad, as I told you before, I had no prospects of an inheritance, and so my father, uh, determining after my second year of schooling that uh, continuation of such would be worthless, he, he, he determined that I would go into a trade. And so he trotted me about Boston, you see, to various uh, tradesmen that he knew uh, to see uh, which might suit me. Uh, for a few weeks, I was engaged in the trade of cutlery, um, but I, found that to be a very boring business. And so he finally, uh, with me showing no interest in any of the trades that he had introduced me to, uh, at a loss, he, he apprenticed me to my older brother, James, who was a printer. A printer. James was a very hard man and uh, a moderately good printer. Uh, I was to be indentured to him until I was 21 years old. 21, a very 
long apprenticeship. Now you have to imagine, I, I, was, I was 10 at the time. And so, the prospect of being with my older brother, who could be very sharp and very hurtful, and was not shy about using his fists, that prospect, uh, I, I didn't think that was what I wished to do. And so at the age of 17, I became an outlaw. I did. I ran away from my indenture in Boston and made my way to Philadelphia with the promise to myself that I would never return. I went on to become a printer there in Philadelphia. Uh, but in answer to your first question, opportunity is perhaps the greatest gift that one can give to his fellow man, particularly the young people. My opportunity was I took, I took my future into my own hands and through the blessings of providence or good fortune or luck or whatever word you wish to put to it, I was able to make my way in the world. But so many others need help and need opportunity and need protection by their community. This is why I believe I have been um, extending my efforts to be giving, to start schools, to start hospitals, the fire company, the, the library, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in my will, which I wrote uh, just two months ago, I set aside bequests, two bequests, of a thousand pounds each, uh, one to the city of Philadelphia, one to the city of Boston, city of my birth, uh, to establish funds at interest uh, that would be given to young married tradesmen, craftsmen, so that they could start their own shops, their own businesses, because I know how difficult that is. It's giving someone the opportunity to succeed. Not, not those who go to Harvard and need no support, but those of the middling sort who are striving for the betterment of themselves and their families who need, who need a little extra. And that is why I've established these funds. It is, I think, important that if you are one of means, and I am fortunate enough after so many years to be so, uh, one owes it to one's community to support those types of efforts and to pay back in some way all that the community has given to me and to mine. It is, it is to my mind, um, God's will and what we should do as a people. Uh, what was the other part of your question? I forgot. Oh, books, yes. Well, perhaps the one that had the most influence at all was... <laughs> uh, yes, well, I came across... I came across when I was apprenticing as, with my brother as a printer. I came across some bound copies of an old magazine called The Spectator. It was published in London. And it would have, it would have commentary, it would have stories, it would have poems, it would have all these wonderful things. And I poured through those volumes. I would, I would look at the, the writings and the arguments that were put forward in, the, in various opinions, and I would write down the salient points, and I would mix up all of that and try and reconstruct it in my mind to see how those points, how those arguments were made in a logical manner. So I've lost track of them, I'm afraid, but I think 
perhaps the most influential books in my life were those copies of the of the Spectator from the 1730s that happened to wind up in the shop and that I dissected and digested to the best of my ability. Well, there are some who say I'm cagey, and perhaps, <laughs> perhaps this is the best example. The French court was unlike anything I'd ever seen. You see, uh, even having been in Britain, uh, the French court was very, very different. And their manners were very, very different. And their dress was very, very different. And I remember writing back to my daughter, Sally, and telling her, you wouldn't even know me. You wouldn't even know me. I'm all tricked up like a Frenchman uh, with, with a, a grand wig, yes, and fine uh, silk clothing. And, and I, I, I've quite taken up their mannerisms, even to the point of having the urge to make love to my best friend's wife. <laughs> Which, of course, I didn't, <laughs> but <laughs> it was simply an observation. Um, the French court was a marvelous place. Great minds, great art, great music. And the ability to convince the French court that their support of our efforts were in their best interest, that that took some work. That took some work. And it was not only in France, it was also in Spain as well. Here you had two traditional, long-standing enemies of Britain, particularly the French, who had not that long ago been insulted by their defeat in the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War who wished for nothing more than revenge. They saw an opportunity to weaken their traditional rival, Britain. To say that I played on that might be fair, but I did point out the opportunities and the advantages of assisting us in our cause. Because with our eventual victory and free trade with France, it would be greatly to their advantage. And if France were part of the peace settlement, France could gain back uh, some of those dominions that they lost to Britain during the Seven Years' War, some of their island possessions. Now, this was successful. This was successful. I think had the court in France envisioned what would happen in the course of their own revolution, they perhaps would not have been so anxious to support us. But they were, at first grudgingly, and then more, and then more, willing to give us money, give us loans, give us men, give us ships, and that, that sealed our victory. It was very delicate negotiations, but thankfully they were successful. I have at home a, a portrait, a small portrait um, presented to me by His Majesty. Uh, it has got uh, 40, um, 40 some uh, diamonds around the uh, uh, frame. And I, I've left it to my daughter uh, with the specific instructions uh, that the diamonds are never to be removed and put into any sort of bubbles or ear bobs or rings or anything of that nonsense. Uh, all of that, I believe, is, is it, well, it's trash. You know, this jewelry business. No, 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 one must be frugal. One must watch where, where one spends one's money. Do you remember my story about the whistle? My whistle, yes? 
I saw this whistle, and I, I wanted it dearly. I wanted it more than anything in the world. Uh, and, and, and so I went to no ends of trouble obtaining the small, as I look back, small amount uh, required for this whistle. But of course, at my age, it, it was a fortune. I bought the whistle, and then I found that I could have bought it for a third the price of what I paid. Well, I was devastated. Devastated. I couldn't even play the thing. No, I threw it away. I, <laughs> one must watch how one spends one's money. But as we were saying before, one must watch more carefully how one's representatives spend one's money. <laughs> that will be your challenge. <laughs>
disinterested men, that they only focus on the common good, the good of the nation, the governance of ourselves, that we do not, we do not take from the public purse, because after all, that's nobody's money, it's just there. No, it is someone's, it's ours. And that we don't point out those who do not support the community. If we are honest with ourselves, we cannot fail. We cannot fail. And this nation, founded on principles and ideals unlike any that have existed in the world before, we shall become as a Garden of Eden. We shall want for nothing. I often wish that I could have been born 300 years hence so that I could see what resulted. I could see where we are, how much we have progressed, the new inventions, the things that will, will, will aid us to not only communicate with one another, but to find cures. Can you imagine it? Cures for dread diseases like smallpox, which took my son when he was four years old, or cancer. These can be done, and I long to see them. Now, we have a bright future, a bright future, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. We may occasionally lose our way, but we are the American people. We were born out of revolution. We are here because we want to be. And we are here because we know that we, we are able to accomplish anything. That is our future. Thank you.